Welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Cohen. I'm the director of the Graduate Program in International Affairs and the director of the Observatory on Latin America. Uh, we're really delighted that you could all join us uh, this afternoon for a lecture by Dr. Alicia Barsana, who's the Executive Secretary of the UN Commission, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, and commentary followed by commentary by, by two very distinguished economists, Dr. Giovanni Andrea Cornia um, of the University of Florence and Martin Sanbu of the editorial board of the Financial Times. I'd particularly like to welcome uh, this afternoon the distinguished delegation of colleagues from ECLAC uh, who've come to New York to participate in, the, in this event and the conference that we'll be having for the next two days. And I'd like to also acknowledge the presence here of our Dean, uh, Neil Grabois, the Dean of the Milano's, Milano and GPIA School for Management and International Affairs, and Tom Cruz uh, from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, who's been helpful in, in organizing our, our event. We, we appreciate everyone being here. I'm particularly delighted to, to welcome uh, David Van Zandt, the, the president designate of the New School. Uh, you could join us this afternoon um, and give some introductory remarks. Um, in many senses, this is a, this is a very auspicious moment. Uh, it's a moment of, of change in the region. Um, it's a change here in our university. Uh, somehow it feels appropriate to be in this room, the inner sanctum of the university, where many of the struggles and values are reflected in these wonderful murals uh, by the Mexican muralist Orozco. Um, it's a moment of, of opportunity, and, and we're, we're very excited. Um, I would also like to say that, that despite this positive excitement, we're, we're also very sad about the death of former President, Arge Argentine President Nestor Kirchner last week. Uh, five weeks ago, the Observatory in Latin America of the New School had the honor to receive former President Kirchner here. Uh, he met in Wolman Hall. Some of you were there. He gave a very passionate and uh, articulate speech about his hopes and ambitions for UNASUR. Um, and we were shocked by the loss of this deeply committed leader who also really had led his own country out of the terrible crisis of 2001-2002. Um, our relationship with President Kirchner went back to September 2003, when then as a recently elected president, uh, he and the First Lady, then uh, Senator Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, came to the New School to talk about their plans for managing the recovery of the Argentine economy from the crisis. At his request, we also organized, actually in this room, a private consultation with Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz when they were talking about some of the economic issues uh, facing, uh, facing Argentina at that time. In 2003, we established the Argentine Observatory, and the First Lady served as chair of the advisory committee. Um, this was later transformed into the Observatory in Latin America in 2006, also in this room, in recognition of the important political changes in the region. As you know, there have been many important new leaders, newly progressive leaders in, from Latin America who had been elected in this, in this past decade. Uh, former President Kirchner visited the New School again in 2004. This time was for a public conversation with Paul Krugman about whether Argentina should be paying its debt and under what circumstances. That was an enormous event, uh, which was held in Arnhold Hall. There were 300 people inside the room and 200 people out on the street trying to get in. We realized we didn't quite have the capacity to, to receive all of this, this interest. Um, so. And we have now, uh, since, since last week, sent our best wishes and condolences to President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner for her, for her loss. We're honored here today by the presence of Argentine Consul General Ricardo Larriera. Thank you for coming, Consul General. Um, and in honor of the, the former president, I would like you to join me in a moment of silence.
Thank you. This afternoon's event has developed from our appreciation of the excellent and thought-provoking work of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean for many years, and particularly for the outstanding report, The Time for Equality, which was written and widely disseminated in Latin America in the last several months. <coughs> our reading of the report led, led us to two important conclusions about the region and also about how a university could relate to some of the contents of that, of that report. First, we believe strongly that in the United States, there needs to be more recognition of the economic experience of Latin America. That there's a lot of focus on other parts of the world, but the reality is that, in, particularly in the context of the global crisis, that Latin America has done considerably better than Europe and the United States in dealing with growth and unemployment, and I would dare say with equity as well. So there's, a, there's an important issue of recognition of what is going on in, in an, another part of the world. But secondly, we're also asking ourselves the question here in the university, what are the implications of this experience in Latin America? And how are they applicable to what's going on in the rest of the world? How do they relate to, your, to the United States and to Europe? And, and what can be learned from this experience? And how, in fact, that experience can be given more, more diffusion, more, under, more understanding? And what are some of the questions that still need, need to be asked? What are the questions for research and further, further work? These questions fit into the work of the Observatory in Latin America, which has brought together many distinguished Latin Americans to the university. This project we call Latin America on the Move, and indeed it's a moving target. There are many people moving, they're coming here, we're pleased with their, their presentations and we're, we're learning a lot in this university. And that's reflected in the large numbers of students who've been sent uh, overseas to work in, to work, uh, in, in various parts of, of the region. We've sent from the Graduate Program in International Affairs probably 70 to Rio, 80 to Buenos Aires, uh, 20 to Bogota, a number to Mexico, a number to Guatemala. And so this is part of what we do and we're, we're learning constantly through in this process. The other project of the Observatory in Latin America is Building Latin American Bicentennials, which is led by Professor Margarita Gutman. This project has led to a partnership with seven academic institutions in five Latin American countries. And, and it studies how, in fact, these countries are commemorating their anniversary from Spain and the anniversary of their independence from Spain and what can be learned from how they commemorate and how commemoration and history relates to current issues and current considerations of, of policy and, and mobilization. So there's a background here and it's in that context that it's a real honor to introduce uh, David Van Zandt, the president-designate to the new school, who will become our president on January 1, uh, 2011. President-designate. Well, I want to extend my welcome to everyone here. Uh, it's great to, great to see you all here. Uh, this is my first uh, official event, uh, as I, I guess it's not really official until January 1st. I can't say that. Uh, but um, I'm really pleased that I have this opportunity to speak at this forum because it's something I personally uh, care a fair amount. Uh, my own area has been international finance, and a lot of it's had to do with Latin America and in the financial aspects of the Latin American um, uh, economies over the, over the years. And I think it's great uh, that ECLAC is here and that we have uh, this conference going on because I think the approach that ECLAC has followed to the uh, problems in Latin America is very congruent with what the New School tries to do, which is really a multidisciplinary approach, uh, trying to think out of the box, um, some, some heterodox uh, economic thinking, which I think is probably well needed, well needed not just in Latin America, but throughout the, uh, throughout the world. Um, and uh, also because, uh, because this is a very international place. One of the big attractions to me of taking this job was the, the outward focus. Uh, it not only is it in a great city, which is a world city like New York, but with 20% of our students coming from outside, uh, outside the U.S., I think this is a real, uh, it's a wonderful place for that kind of, um, uh, that kind of, of experience. Uh, it is, it is great that we can put this conference on today. I thank Michael um, for 
hard work in doing this, and it's uh, uh, my honor, uh, my honor to be uh, to be here. I think one challenge we have at the new school will be to take all the wonderful parts, many of which uh, Michael was describing, and pulling it all together so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And that's what I'm really dedicated to doing over the next next number of years uh, um, here at the. Um, here at the new school, and this is just a, a great way to, a uh, great way to um, kick this, uh, to kick this off. What's well, in this context uh, that the university is proud to welcome uh, Dr. Alicia uh, Barcina, the executive director of the UN Economic Commission on Latin America, and her distinguished colleagues, a number of whom are with us here, with us here today. Dr. Barcina epitomizes the multidisciplinary perspective. She is a distinguished Mexican social scientist with an important record as an environmental leader in her work at the Earth Council after the Earth Summit in the 1990s. And she became a senior member of the UN Secretariat, later a division chief in ECLAC, and since 2009, the executive secretary of ECLAC. Today, she will be talking about the ECLAC report, The Time for Equality, an important publication which sets out an intellectual and political challenge to the Latin American region as well as to the global community at large. After her presentation, uh, we'll have comments by two very distinguished uh, economists, uh, Professor Giovanni Andrea Cornia of the University of Florence and former director of the UN World Institute for Development Economics Research, uh, and also and Martin Sanbu, a member of the editorial uh, board of the Financial Times. And then after they speak, we will have time for questions from the audience. So without more, Dr. Cena. Well, thank you very much, and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for being here this evening, and I want to thank most especially uh, to you uh, for giving me this very warm welcome and to having you as, as incoming president of this university coming to this particular event in this wonderful room, which is a Mexican room where I come from, too. So I think this is so important in many ways. So thank you so much. And to Michael Cohen, I want to really pay tribute because you have been instrumental in putting this together with Margarita Gutman and, of course, my colleagues from ECLAC, Martina Vélez in particular, who is a former professor from these uh, new school universities. Thank you so much, and my colleagues are also with us today. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. David Van Sant. I really appreciate this uh, occasion to be with you. And, um, Indeed, I think we, I have to tell you why ECLAC put together this report, because I think it's, it's so crucial that uh, we share with you that ECLAC has a story, as you know, we have a history almost of more than 60 years of existence in which the thinking of ECLAC has evolved from uh, what we are very well known, I think, historically, which is import substitution to rethinking development in many alternative ways. So, we thought that after the crisis, it was essential to put together and to try to collect the thinking of ECLAC into the perspective of what's happening precisely today. And that's what we are trying to do in this report. So let me see if this works, hopefully. It should, right? It should. Anyway, but just, uh, I hope so. Yay. You see? Perfect. Thank you. So where is Latin America today? I mean, before we go, what, what we're trying to do with this report is to have a long-term vision. But to have a long-term vision, we have to start where we are now. So where are we now? And I think we are learning from the past. We are coming from a very prudent, uh, uh, let's say, phase of our economy in, in the past years, but also very progressive. You see, there was a combination during the last I would say decade in Latin America, where we had pr macro prudent policies, but with very social progressive governments. Not all of Latin America, as you know, we are a very heterogeneous region, but in general, I would say the leadership of our region, and we have here, of course, Pedro Baez who, from Ecuador, who can say this in Argentina and Brazil, and these countries were at the same time being prudent on the macroeconomic front, but at the same time being very progressive in social terms. Chile itself was very important in that regard. Now, our economies and the region is, is ready to boost the economies, and we are actually recovering quite well, as we will see. And I think all the governments of the region, though, I mean, have gone into a very interesting shift. 
which is that the political leaders of the region are taking up development in their hands. And this was not happening before. To tell you the truth, many of the economics of our region were handled, not because we don't like them, but the finance ministers were the ones who were charting the course of development, or non-development, whatever, or growth, or whatever. But now that the heads of state themselves are really, uh, you know, so politics is back. La política regresó. Politics is back in the, in the real sense of the word. And we have the urgency to eliminate the legacy of inequality. What are we learning from history? Number one is that we come from a world that was totally a deregulated global uh, world. I mean, the market was really the one in charge of everything, at least in the last two decades. And of course, the, we come from a globalization that is was a very uh, asymmetric in many fronts. I mean, capital flows were free, and of course financial flows were free in, in every sense of the word. Tr uh, trade was open and so forth. However, migration or labor was not free, and it's not indeed. So we live in a very asymmetric world, even after globalization is even worse. And of course, we come from a massive destruction of financial wealth in, in developed countries accompanied by a credit crunch at, of some sort. Now, this contraction of the global economy is, is, although we have some recovery in, the, in 2010 and 2011, probably, but still, we believe in ECLAC that it's going to come back to a slow recovery. Because the developed world is not growing, because the developed world is not consuming. And of course, uh, my, my colleagues will discuss this tomorrow in, in detail, in Pocantico, when we are there. But the most problem, I mean, I mean, the problematic thing here and the worrisome here is the jobless recovery. We are in the middle of a jobless mm -hmm. recovery where uh, maybe we are growing, maybe we are uh, exporting, but with very little creation of jobs. And of course, the new role of the emerging economies is taking us to an urgent, urgent redesign of the global architecture, uh, multilateral architecture in general, but definitely in the financial architecture. And up to now, we understand that uh, the G20 in the 8th of November is very far from taking us to this global public good of financial stability, frankly speaking. There's no agreement. There's actually very, I would say, divided positions of how the world is going to uh, face the coming, uh, uh, I would say, the coming years. Now, our region was better prepared than in previous crises. Of course, we were better, better prepared. Less integrated, though. Why were we better prepared? Number one, because in this period uh, between 2002 and 2008, basically 2003 and 2008, the region was able to reduce in a very important way the um, public debt. I mean, we were today remembering Nestor Kirchner, right? Well, Argentina was really a, a very successful uh, country in that regard in 2003, 2008 they were able to reduce the public debt. And, and the public debt is, is very important to, because it gives space to, 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 the, to, the, to the countries. And of course, our countries were also able to strengthen the public finances, to reduce this indebtedness, and of course, to increase international reserves. And I think this is another of the elements that is there. It's very important how our countries were capable of increasing uh, uh, their international reserves. Now, I think that in, in this period of 2003-2008, there were three uh, simultaneous macroeconomic facts that I think we should, we should really uh, underline. Number one, the sound fiscal policies and a better public uh, debt profile. In fact, the public debt was going down, although the private debt was going up, by the way, but the public debt was going down, no question about it. More flexible exchange rates, and high international reserves. During that period, and now about, about exchange rates, we have a lot to talk about, I think, tomorrow in Pocantico, because that's our real problem today. But anyway. And then, of course, a regional current account surplus with economic growth. This is the first time in history that Latin America had these three macroeconomic facts at the same time. And of course, there was some uh, access to external financing. Trade increased in this, in this period enormously. And the terms of trade improved. The per capita GDP grew more than 3% per year. And in that period between 2003 and 2008, 
employment was able to grow uh, in, in an important way. So unemployment decreased from 11 to 7.3 percent. Now in the crisis, we thought that an unemployment was going to grow even higher, and we were going to get up in 2009 to levels of 9 percent. However, due to the programs applied by countries, particularly the Southern Cone countries applied very active policies on employment, Unemployment in 2009 is going to close near to 8.3%, but still is high for our reach. Now, I think the most important thing to see, and I know that Andrea has, has wrote, written a paper on, on how the, uh, in the last decade particularly, con the, our region has really done a lot of effort in decreasing poverty. And not only pro poverty, but the income gap, and that is inequality. Our region has done a great effort on that. During the last decade in the 80s, look how poverty grew from 40% to 48%. You know, at the end of the 80s, really half of the Latin American population were poor. Now, that was the result of the last decade of, nine, of the 80s. In the decade of the 90s, it was a difficult decade, but still the governments understood that some investment on social issues should be you know, direct. But when it was really important was when these social progressive governments came into office, where they really made the decision of uh, putting their uh, stamina, their strength, and their policies into poverty, and poverty went down for 44% to 33%. 10 points it was able to improve the situation in Latin America. So besides the improvement in poverty rates, there were also for the first time ever, ever in the history of Latin America, we have been imp seen improvements in income distribution. For the first time, at least in eight of the economies of our region, we were able to see the improvement of income, to the closing of the income distribution gap. Still uh, small uh, improvements, but improvements at the end of the day. And this is the first time that we were able to have these equality indicators, like the Gini index, for example, which improved between 3 and 10 percent. In 10, actually, it's really in 8 out of 20 countries. Income in poor household improved 20 percent, and that is really important. And because one of the hypotheses of this document is that you need to, uh, to run for equality if you want to grow. That is, one of the elements of growth is equality, just like Brazil did it. Brazil gave the poor households capacity purchasing power through redistributive uh, transfers, and that's the way that economy really is recuperating, because the poor are the ones who have consumption power, because they want to buy more, they need, their needs are there, so the rich are not the ones who are going to push the economy, but the poor are the ones who can push the economy if they have the resources. So that's, I think, one of the hypotheses of our document. And, and to finish this, this part where it's only a, a coyuntura, I mean, the, the, the side of the, what's happening now, I would like to say that the speed of the recovery of this crisis was really faster compared with other crises that the region has been uh, going through. The previous exceptional period of prosperity Actually, the one between 2003 and 2008 created a space for public, for public policies. That's, that's what really happened, that during 2009, our countries were in the middle of the crisis, but they had space to apply some public policies that were so important. For example, monetary and financial policies, fiscal policies that were counter-cyclical, trade policies, and labor policies. Trade, therefore, is increasing in a very important way in Latin America. However, one sign of alarm that I want to say in terms of the trade that we are having in Latin America is that the exports of Latin America are basically from the primary sector, from uh, basic, from raw materials that are now benefiting from the high prices. And basically, in South America, we are seeing what we call the reprimarization of trade. That is, uh, the composition of the trade structure is going to back to 
natural resources. Now, whether this is good news or bad news is all depending on how we use it. Of course, everybody's a little bit afraid of the, of the Dutch disease. Uh, Krugman, we were discussing today, wrote a paper back in the 80s, I think it was in the 80s, right, where he was discussing how to really handle this in a way that it could be positive for development instead of uh, falling into the Dutch disease. But anyway, that's a sign of alarm that we have, especially in South America. And in Central America and Mexico, since the uh, U.S. Is, is recovering, we can see that uh, the export composition of Central America and Mexico are basically manufacturing products, but of very low uh, technological intensity. So still, we have a very a huge problem in terms of productive uh, matrix. Tourism is recovering, remittances too. The region has returned to international financial markets. The private sector is recovering. And of course, there is a little bit of push in the increase of employment. But tomorrow, Osvaldo Casef is going to draw on this. I think you're going to go into details on how Latin America is growing. Because this year, Latin America is going to grow above 5.6%. Our initial figure was 5.2. We are even, we think even that we're going to go closer to 6%. Look at Paraguay, look at Brazil. I think Brazil is going to go up even 8%. But anyway, I mean, we are now in the process of reviewing how the economy in our region is going to be. But this is where Latin America stands today, with the exception, of course, of Venezuela and Haiti, Haiti because we know the, the the, the earthquake was very damaging. And in the case of Venezuela, the, the structure is something that we might, we may wish to, to discuss. Why do we think it's time for equality in Latin America and the Caribbean? We believe that um, the dominant model really created a, I mean, the end of the, of the dominant model in 2008 produced a point of inflection, a turning point. A turning point and an opportunity to chart a new course. An opportunity to make the questions about the development model, because we think that this development model, at least in the last two decades, has been terribly associated with a high wealth concentration. Has been opening the gaps between the rich and the poor, between the technological frontier. It has opened and opened gaps rather than closing gaps. And this is a, a time where we are rethinking everything. We all know here, I'm sure in this room, but we are now even more conscious that development and growth <coughs> are not synonymous. That growth is not the only thing we need to really develop. And that's why we are making the challenge at this young juncture to really achieve greater equality. We think that the region is facing at least six very important gaps. And that's why our document is called Closing Gaps and Opening Trails, because these are the gaps at least that we need to close. And one of them is we have the worst income distribution in the world. We are not the poorest region, but we have the worst income distribution. We, we are the most unequal region in the world, even more than Africa, more than Asia, more than anybody. So that's a record that I think we have to really overcome at some point. Secondly, we have a very heterogeneous production pattern. And I'm going to explain a little bit uh, later what I'm, I'm talking about. We have companies that are very close to the technological frontier. And the majority of uh, small and medium-sized companies are at the very low productivity uh, end. So we will talk about that. But this is historical. Now, the third one is we have very low investment and savings. This is a region that has not been able to save or to really form capital or to invest in productive sectors. Number four is that we have a great segmentation in the labor market. We have people that earn a lot of money that are in social protection and a lot of people that are in informality, precarious job, people that lose their jobs and they lose everything, access to health, to education. You know, so that's the problem. The problem is not that uh, it's only that you, you, you have a loss of jobs. It's because you lose everything when you lose a job in Latin America and the Caribbean. And of course, we have racial, ethnic, and gender discrimination, which is also historical. And uh, by far, I think our region, and particularly Central America and the Caribbean, have a very asymmetrical vulnerability to climate change. Just as a reflection, you know, we have made a calculation of the accumulated cost of natural disasters in Latin America. And from the 17th to today, 
1972 till 2008, the accumulated cost of natural disasters has been $360 billion, of which 136 are from Central America only. So that means that that particular subregion is really vulnerable to climate change. Now, we believe that social equality and economic growth are not mutually exclusive. This is exactly what I was saying before. Growth needs equality and equality needs growth. They are two very synergic things and we, we need to have macroeconomic conditions that can mitigate volatility, stimulate productivity and mitigate and favor inclusion. And also we have to close the gaps between in the internal and the external gaps in terms of productivity. Now, promoting equality is also about building human skills and about something that we are making our firm belief in this document. Equality is about rights. It's about access to rights, not about access to education and health and opportunities only, because that access is only for those who have the money. We believe that in Latin America we need equality in terms of rights, a right-based approach to equality. That is that any citizen that is born in Latin America should have rights, right to education, to health, to social protection. So universalizing rights and social benefits is what this document is about. We believe that this aspiration has to be there, although we are not there yet. We understand that. But at least let's be clear where we want to go. You know, sometimes we, we say, how do we get there? How much money would it cost? At least let's have the clarity of where do we want to go. And where we want to go is to universal rights and social benefits, to inclusion through the labor market, because we believe that the, the uh, la llave maestra, the key to this is employment and education. And the other thing that we have not taken into account previously is the territorial convergence. Even this reprimarization of, export, uh, of exports is creating more divergence between territories within countries, and we believe this has to be sorted out somehow. It cannot be that La Paz and, and Santa Cruz are so widely, uh, you know, the gap there between the rich and the poor regions is also something that we have to take care of. So, and we believe in ECLAG at least, seriously that we need a larger and stronger state that needs to redistribute, to regulate, and to supervise. We are not talking about going back to statization, not at all. But we are definitely talking about a state that we don't have today, by the way. We don't believe that the state we have now in Latin America is the one we need, but at least we need a state that really provides public goods and the things that the society is looking for. The principle then is equality of rights in pursuit of a shared ethic and ultimate incontrovertible principle. That's the, the bottom line of the document, to make effective the, the economic, social, and cultural rights. How do we get there? This is the four objectives that this document is about. One is that we believe we should work very forcefully through state policies, with the market, with society, for productive and territorial convergence. But we have to be proactive in that sense. We cannot leave it to the market. The market is profoundly an unequalizer because they only, you know, they give the prize to the winners, to the, to the stronger, to the, I mean, in the Darwinian way, to the best adapted, to the most capable. So we need to create opportunities and access for everyone in education, in health, in care, in employment, in social security. And we need economic policies with a specific long-term vision. We believe that we need a macroeconomic policies that are in, that, that are working in favor of a development uh, idea and not the other way around. And that's where I think it's where we need to work very forcefully with active macroeconomic policies that we're going to see very close now. And we need something in Latin America that we need urgently, and that is a fiscal covenant with a redistributive impact. That is, in our region, the, the burden, the tax burden is very far from ideal. And not only far from ideal in terms of quantity, but also in terms of structure and in terms of distribution. So we're going to see that in a moment. But we think that the 
Fiscal covenant is a basic tool for a state to invest in social uh, cohesion, in innovation, in labor institutions, in, in job security, and territorial cohesion. Now, what are the challenges of a new macroeconomy? Now, here we go into the details now. What is going on? What, are, what is the evidence? What is the lessons we have learned up to now? Well, first of all, we have learned that uh, low rate of gross fixed capital formation is the pattern that Latin America has followed. I mean, actually, we have not been able to uh, recuperate the investment before the 70s. Before the 70s, the region was, investment, was investing, uh, I mean, beyond 25% of GDP. Now we are in 18% of GDP, or maybe 20, maybe a little bit higher than 18%, but still is very low rate of fixed capital formation. We have a very highly volatile growth, GDP growth below potential, and this is the, the basic problem. How do we get to the potential? Our countries have a lot of potential to, to grow, and they don't reach that potential for some reasons. And then, of course, the business cycles are very heavily driven by financial flows. There is short-term speculative and rent-seeking rationales. Even now, we are going through this particular uh, process of rent-seeking and speculative rationales, and we have to do something about it. And this has a lot of effects in exchange rates and volatile pro-cyclical uh, uh, expectations. Look at what's happening now. I mean, all the, all the money, all the currencies in, in Latin America are being appreciated, and this is creating a disincentive for the productive uh, side. So these are the factors that we believe exacerbate segmentation of production and labor. And, of course, they distribute regressively the costs of regression and the benefits of expansion. Our region uh, behaves like a roller coaster of growth. I mean, look at this. We are always responding to the external. I mean, we, we don't have our own, let's say, forms of reacting to, to this roller coaster um, experience. And, and we, we, we see that uh, monetary liquidity, credit, and exchange rates were often dri driven by cyclical uh, movements of financial flows. And this is where we believe this has caused uh, very severe fluctuations in, in, in economic activity and basically in employment. Now, look, I mean, even the, the policies pursued since the 80s didn't produce this rapid, sustained economic growth that was expected. Look at the, at the at behavior of Latin America and the Caribbean, is the red curve. I mean, even look at, at where we were in the 70s, you know, we were uh, above 6%. And look where we are now. I mean, we went down in the decade of the 80s, even in the 90s, with all the structural adjustments, with all the openness, with all the free trade, with all the finance flows with everything Latin America did, we never, never recuperated a real, let's say, sustained economic growth. So that's why we believe that something is wrong. So we have to rethink the whole thing. This is investment. As I was saying, look at the investment rates that Latin America has been unable to recuperate, really, the investment rates before the, uh, the 80s. And of course, exchange rates and financial flows fluctuate very sharply in tune with uh, financial decisions. This is part of the problem that we are living today. And that's where we believe that there are a lot of things that should be done. And these are a couple of suggestions that ECLAC has in this document. First of all, we believe that there has to be a way of achieving overall stability of prices and macro prices and aggregate demand consistent with the potential GDP. That is, how do we bring, how do we close the gap? How do we understand what is the potential GDP that we have in each of our countries? How do we close the gap? But not only in terms of trade, but in terms of employment, which I think is really the, the area where we are missing the point. And then, of course, how do we promote low real volatility and how do we strengthen the counter cyclical role of fiscal policy using fiscal sustainability criteria? This is the most, this third bullet is the most controversial one. This is the controversy between Europe and the United States, actually. I mean, that the United States doesn't want to use fiscal policies because of political constraints. But actually, and they are using only monetary policies, the expansion of the monetary policy. And that's the problem behind all this. And what's happening with Germany and Japan? Of course, everybody's pointing out to, to China, but actually Germany and Japan also will have to come to the table and respond why 
are they not investing on fiscal policies themselves instead of you know talking about fiscal consolidation which is going to take us not very far but anyway but in latin america i think there is this idea of still how far fiscal policy can be used is there space for this fiscal policy to expand or not and this is something that the governments of our region are discussing today we believe that fiscal policies are very important really and that they should be uh, looking at that carefully. And of course the exchange rate behavior, which is basically guided by fundamentals based, uh, we, should, we believe that the exchange rate should be behaving more in connection with the real sector, with the real economy, and not only by speculative capital flows. Let me tell you that when we produced this report last May, still the IMF was not talking about <laughs> capital control. Now they are also talking about this, thank God. Maybe because of ECLAC, I hope so, but they, but originally they were not, let's say, in favor of uh, capital account control, and I think the regulation, let's say. But we believe that this is very important because if the countries don't have some way of controlling speculative flows of capital, there's going to be a real issue. But this is not enough. We were discussing with Osvaldo this morning that or last night, I think, when we were coming down to New York, that we were just up to New York, actually, we were discussing that that uh, the control of the capital accounts is, is not enough. It's not going to be enough of what's happening today, but still, there has to be a set of measures to do that. And of course, we believe that uh, the composition and stability of capital flows is crucial, and we need to distinguish between the speculative nature and those that can be directed to productive investment. And indeed, the other element that I think we is missing strongly in Latin America is a system that is inclusive, a financial system that is inclusive. That is, that brings about credit to the small and medium-sized enterprises, to the families. I mean, the other day I was shocked by a figure that I don't know if it's true, but 20% of the families in Mexico have access to credit, only 20%. 20% out of 110 million people have access to credit, which means that a lot of people, were, if they have savings, where do they put it? You know, below the bed or where, where, where is the money? You know, so that's part of the problem that I believe the financial system, bancarization has to be developed in the reach. Now, in terms of production, and here is Mario Cimoli, who is the guru in Cepal of productive development, and um, we have two gaps in Latin America. One is this external gap, which is the asymmetries in technological capabilities in relation to the international frontier. We are considering the US the international frontier. We will see that in a minute. And the internal gap is how do we close these differences within sectors and within firms within countries? Do we have capacity to do that? Can we do it, not only within countries, but also in a new scheme of integration where we can really you know, start uh, making uh, uh, um, value chains between countries? I think that's something that we can do. But we do need the participation of the state because in Latin America, many countries, many countries gave up their industrial policies. And the, and the instruments and the banking systems and everything. So we need to come back to that. Look at this. The, um, the red line shows the difference between companies, between Latin America and the US. That is, that's the level, in a way, of the gap between the companies of the same, let's say, uh, se productive sector between Latin America and the US. And it shows you the, the level of dispersion between these uh, companies. And the blue line is showing us the relative productivity between Latin America and the US. And you will see that even in the best of times between 2003 and 2008, when the region was in a boom, we were doing great job in terms of growth, productivity went down 10%. The gap of productivity went down. Now this is a very interesting uh, graph that I want to show it to you, and that is, look at the, at the, um, the difference. This, this side of the, of the graph, the left-hand side, compares Latin America and the United States between 1990 and 2007. You know, in these 17 years, what happened? What happened is that, uh, Lat I mean, I'm sorry, this is Latin America with Latin America, and the other side is the US 
with the US. So between 1990 and 2007, the productive structure of Latin America changed very little. That is, we still rely on natural resources, uh, basic uh, economy. That, that's what we are. And the US, on the other end, made a very important, let's say, step, leapfrog. To, they went further to what we call technological advance, because the companies, the sectors, the industrial, uh, let's say, development of, uh, of uh, a knowledge-based um, companies went very high. So you can see that the resource-intensive sectors in the United States were replaced by engineering-intensive sectors. So that's the gap. That's the difference. And that's important for Latin America, because we are way behind the technological frontier. Now, how do we do this? So the objectives we are uh, suggesting in this document is how do we link low productivity sectors with those that are already in the frontier? And also, how do we manage to bring them closer in, in externally, but also internally? And we believe there are four things that need to be done. Number one is greater priority to science and technology. Our region is spending only 0.6% of the GDP in uh, science and technology, in research and development, 0.6%. <coughs> and the OECD countries are investing over 2.5%. And Korea has just decided to invest 4%. And our countries are 06 thanks to Brazil, by the way. Otherwise, we will be very down the line. You know, Mexico is 0.2, something like that. So it's really uh, something that our governments, our public expenditure has to look at. It's not going to be the, the private sector who's going to invest in research and development for, for, the, for, for everyone. It has to be the state. It has to be a state policy. Second, we need an explicit industrial policy. We believe that we have to come back to an explicit industrial policy that has, we have to develop institutions like development banking to promote innovation and internal convergence. Look what Brazil has done again. The BNDES, the Banco Nacional del Desarrollo de Brazil, it's 17 times larger than the IDB, by the way, but it's a national bank. It's a national bank that is supporting the national uh, productive change. And so we need that. We need to bring back that intention of having a, an institution of development. And of course, we need this. In, and that will bring about, by the way, inclusive financing to support the small and medium-sized companies. You know that small and medium-sized companies represent 80% of employment in Latin America. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about 80% of the employment of the region. So we believe we need a proactive industrial policy. We also need a, a, a policy to discipline the private recipients of rents. And I know this is hard, but we have to discuss seriously royalties. We have to discuss seriously subsidies, regulations. Let me put you an example. Everybody thinks that royalties are taxes. You know, royalties is an intergenerational instrument. I mean, if you are extracting copper in Chile today, and the future generations are not going to have access to copper, I mean, somebody has to pay for the future generations to have a, an alternative sector for their own growth and development. And that has to be the destiny of the royalties. Royalties are not for the short term. Royalties on natural resources are for the next generations. And we believe that this has to be seriously discussed. This is what Australia did. This is what New Zealand did. This is what Finland did. And this is what we should be discussing today. Instead of Peru and, 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 and Chile and all of these resource intensive countries giving up everything. What's going to happen to the future generations? What's going to happen to science and technology? And of course, we believe that this uh, is uh, something that has to be done also in terms of environmental sustainability, because uh, there is a, 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 a very important thing there. Territorial cohesion, you know, this is a very pronounced, I would say, gap in the region. This inequality is really affecting productive, institutional, and social development. You know, part of the drug uh, trafficking in Mexico has to do to the lack of territorial convergence. What's really happening is that the nature of, drug, uh, of the drug business has changed. Before, 
drug, the people who, the drug dealers and the drug producers were clandestine. They wanted to be not noticed, you know, like evading everything. They didn't want to be public. What's happening today is that they are getting appropriation of the territory. This is what's happening in reality. This is what happened in Colombia, this is what's happening in Mexico, is that due to the lack of convergence in the territory, we are going into this nature of reappropriation of the territory by illegal crime instead of by the state. And those are the ones who are collecting the taxes, by the way, because drug dealers are collecting taxes at the territorial level and not the government. So this is something that we need to change. We need to really change. And to make sure that we are also concentrating on something that Margarita will agree with me, which is the cities. 77% uh, of Latin America has, been, has become urban. So this urbanization process has been, instead of helping us to build, it, this is what's happening to China now. China is becoming urban and urban and urban. Hopefully they won't re reproduce and replicate what we did in Latin America, this urbanization in a very unequal terms that is happening basically at the level of the city. So we believe that to, to make this level geography of productivity and well-being less unequal, we need to develop explicit instruments and guidelines for territorial convergence. And we're not talking here about only decentralization processes, because decentralization was very I mean, failed in Latin America because we were decentralizing responsibilities but no resources. That's not the way. The way is that there has to be some sort of cohesion funds that need to be created within the countries, a la European. Europe did this between countries. We are not suggesting between countries because that requires a very difficult negotiation process, although the Mercosur countries are discussing that, although. But what we are talking about is that the rich, the winning areas of a region, of a, of a country, should be helping the looser regions of that country. And we believe this is very important, and that's where civil society can play a very important role. I would say that uh, labor, and as we said, employment, is one of the most important factors in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have two decades of very poor labor market, performance, improvements, and very high rates of unemployment. But the most difficult part, I think, is informality. Informality is really at the, at the very heart of the problem in Latin America, that the labor institutions are perpetuating inefficient and exclusionary and unequal labor markets, and this is very unfavorably, especially for women and for young people. You know, unemployment rates in Latin America is 8.3%, but for young people it's double you know, or maybe three times, but, but it's really very high. At least double, no, Martin? At least double, right, for young people, absolutely. So here we are in, in labor market participation. We see employment, unemployment. Of course, it, it didn't go up as, as much as we thought it would, but still we have a, a very poor, a very poor performance on, the, on, on employment. This is what we are talking about when we talk about a potential GDP. We are also talking about the labor force that we have in Latin America and that it's uh, not getting to sufficient employment. And we believe that we have to guarantee the effect efficient functioning of the labor markets, access to training is super important, voice and representation and bargaining rights to the, to the, to the unions. I mean, we believe that Latin America cannot give up into the union organization and the minimum wage. One of the elements we have studied also again in Brazil and in Argentina and in Uruguay, by the way, these three countries are very successful in terms of the minimum wage. The role of the minimum wage has been essential and for example, Uruguay, at the same time they were pulling together a policy on minimum wage, they were able to pass the most, I would say, interesting uh, fiscal reform in the last, I would say, five years. And it was because there was a, a minimum wage policy and the quality and formalization of employment was very much at the bottom line of their own, uh, of their own policies. And of course, we think that we have to reduce the reliance on payroll taxes and go more to a shift to non-contributory models. 
and we have to make more incentives and exemptions to promote formalization of the small and medium-sized companies. A lot of people are talking about labor flexibility. We don't think that's the way to go. We do believe there is a middle, a middle ground between informalization, total informalization, and uh, total rights in a way. But that doesn't mean we give up and we go for fl uh, flexibility as a goal. It could be in the road towards, but not as a goal. Now, the challenges of, in the social sphere are very important. We do have this persistent inequality that recently dropped. Intergeneration reproduction of poverty. This is something that in Latin America we have to overcome. And that is, how do we go for a social mobility process that is sustainable? That is, why does people have to be born poor and die poor? No, I think social mobility is precisely what we need in Latin America. How do we go from the poor family or poor children that was born in a poor uh, household, and how does that person can really move in the social chain? And that's something that we are working on very, very closely to see which are those households that are highly vulnerable to shocks, low insurance levels, few assets. How do we help women to go into the labor market? Because in Latin America, women are taking care of the, of the children. And now with the demographic change, they are going to take care of the elder. But they are never free to go to the labor market. So how do we, how do we help? in terms of social policies to make sure that the, the women who are better prepared than men, by the way, we have demonstrated that women today are much better prepared than men in terms of primary school, secondary school, tertiary school. But they don't have the capacity, the, the, let's say, the viability, the space to go to the labor market. And that's something we have to work on this. And of course, the social spending with little progressive impact is something that we are also very worried about. We believe that the cash transfers uh, programs have been very progressive to really target the very, very poor people. But it's not a sustainable program that has to be evaluated in time. Now. We have, as I said before, a decade without progress in income distribution. So, uh, you can see here a comparative analysis of 16 countries. Now look what happened in the, de in the recent decade, between 2002 and 2008. We have all these countries that are below the, the middle line that have been able to make progress in terms of the Gini uh, coefficient. I mean, only the ones who couldn't make any progress were Costa Rica. You know, strangely, uh, uh, but of course, the departing uh, point of Costa Rica is much better than Honduras, of course, and Guatemala, and Colombia, and, uh, and, and uh, um, uh, Dominican Republic. These are more or less a synthesis of how uh, poverty uh, is still very concentrated among women and children. But there were, as I said, some improvements in terms of Gini, in terms of unemployment. Employment, we have a mixed uh, uh, picture here. Indigents, that is uh, the very poor below the, the, the line of poverty. We have 20% of people in the, in the low uh, line of poverty. And it was improved at least six points really during that decade and poverty improved from 44 to 33 percent. And that is, I mean, social spending in the region has gone up. As I said before, the social progressive, something that I think the leftist, uh, I would say, movements in the region have, have been able to provide to the governments, even to the right-wing governments today, is that everybody agrees that social spending expenditure is extremely important. We made a study demonstrating that in the last, let's say, since the crisis of the 80s, it costed 14 years to come back to the to the GDP, GDP per capita in the lower in the levels that were before the decade of the 80s, but it took 25 years to recuperate the social levels of poverty. So it takes longer in terms of social parameters to get back after a crisis. So everybody is understanding this. As I said before, even the right-wing governments, even everybody in the region agrees that social spending has to be there. And that is a contribution of the progressive, uh, I would say, uh, governments themselves. And the challenge of the, of the state, we believe, is how to redistribute income. I mean, and this document is saying that we need to universalize entitlements and rights. 
But it also says that the only way to get this done is through productive convergence. But in the meantime, we need social policies. We cannot leave the poorest of the poor alone. We need to help them to try to get to the level of productivity of the rest of the society. And that's why we are talking about a very active role of the state in the social sphere to guarantee direct distribution of income or redistribution of income and also to build systems of guaranteed partial income. Some people are talking about a citizen income, el salario ciudadano, that you need at least the basics to make that household live. And that is through the children, to the families, to the older adults, to the working age unemployed. But there has to be some income in each of the households of Latin America has to be there. And that is access to solidarity-based health insurance and also to leveling up education and educational achievement. One of our major problems in Latin America today is quality of education. Not really access that much, but quality is one of our great problems. And of course, the creation of a network and quality public supply to take care of the young children and the elders, because otherwise the women are always stuck. I mean in the good sense of the word. Of course, we love children and we love the elders, but we would like to be free to work, don't we? So, and the thing is that we are suggesting seven proposals here, very concrete, and in the document you will find that there is a costing exercise. We divided the countries of the region in groups of countries, and we are costing each one of them, each one of the groups, how much would it cost to them to get to these seven proposals, and that is, to make non-contributory transfers to families with children over 14 years of age or less. Argentina did that already, and it has been, it has proved to be very successful. Secondly, how do you make transfers to elder people, universal or wide coverage? Chile did that with great success. Transfers to the unemployed, that is, we need to have an unemployment, uh, seguro de desempleo? Insurance. Unemployment insurance for all. You know, before the crisis, only a couple of countries had an, un an, an, an unemployment insurance. Now, many countries have an unemployment insurance. And there has been a lot of analysis of how these unemployment insurances can, can help people to get back to the, to the workforce. At the end of the day, that's what we want. We also believe in this coverage from a zero to five, uh, education coverage and early childhood. We believe that this has been very successful in those countries that have uh, applied those policies and non-contributory basic health care packages. You know, this is extremely important because the rich are developing their own hospitals and their own systems and their own, so the segregation is starting by them because they are creating their own little things. And what about the rest? So we believe there has to be a non-contributory system and target the systems of incentives uh, to complete uh, secondary school. Let me finish by saying uh, the, the last part of our, of our story in this document is that how do we do this? We believe that we need a new equation between state, market, and society. Nobody can do it alone. The market proved to fail. The states alone will not make it unless there is a poor citizen, a, a, a real strong citizenship created behind. And that is a society that is really there to back or to at least negotiate or at least to be interested on these things and to have a long-term vision at the end of the day. Because we believe that there's uh, changing the productive structure through macroeconomic and horizontal and sectoral policies is going to hurt some countries, but has to be done. And we have to send out the right signals to market to reduce inequality and negative incentives. And of course, we have to promote the social inclusion, more jobs, and redirect uh, redistribution through public policies, transfer, social promotion, protection. At the end of the day, we're talking about how to provide public goods with a universal uh, vocation. We believe that the fiscal covenant is essential. We won't be able to do this without resources. There has to be a policy there on how to enhance the state capacity to make sure that there is the money there. 
and we have to solve three problems in, in Latin America. Number one is the tax system deliver low levels of revenue and are very badly designed. Our tax structure is regressive. We have a very low tax burden in the majority of the countries. High levels of evasion, I mean, it's terrible when you see, as I said before, I mean, the drug dealers understand that where they, there is a lot of evasion, they come in, you know, so that's the problem. Widespread exemptions, instead of being the exception, the exemptions are being generalized, like in the case of Guatemala, for example. Social spending with very little redistributive impact, a very weak non-contributory pillar, and of, in terms of production, there has to be more support to the small and medium-sized uh, companies. And of course, there is insufficient uh, investment in development. In infrastructure, for example, there has to be more public funds directed to infrastructure. Research, as I said before, science and innovation. In development banking systems, and of course, how do we get to a green economy that this document is not covering, but indeed in CEPAL we are working very strongly on the future of the green economy. Look at us. Look at us compared to OECD. This is the tax burden in Latin America, 18% compared to 36% in OECD countries, or 39 in the European Union. So our tax burden is really very low. And the structure of our taxing system is also very regressive because we have very little of direct tax burden compared to the OECD countries and others. And of course, why do we say it's regressive? Look at this. You know, in, in Europe, which is this, this part of the equation, we will see how in the, in the, let's say, going down the line, that is where Europe is and New Zealand and, and the countries that after tax, after tax collection, they become more equal. They, let's say, they can solve inequality more or less in a 30% average. Our countries, after tax collection, they don't, um, they cannot solve inequality, they could even get worse. And inequality can probably, let's say, improve 3%. But that is something that in the document we are covering with great detail on how country by country, let's say, after taxes and bef before taxes and after taxes, what happens to inequality. And you will find that our region is very regressive. So we are suggesting a very clear cut path in terms of gradually increasing the tax burden with a view of creating tax systems that can provide incentives to the productive investment. A reform, we definitely are talking about fiscal reform. We are talking about improving the tax collection and reducing progressively uh, tax evasion and exemptions. And of course, how do we do this with the political actors? Because this has been said many times in Latin America, we need to sit down with the political actors, with the parliaments, with society. And because I believe that the citizens of Latin America need to understand that the financing of our development has to come from us. It's not going to come from the taxpayers in Europe. It's not going to come from the taxpayers in the Nordic countries. It is going to come from our own tax paying. Of course, we all want this tax paying to be clear with the public agenda, with transparency, with um, accountability, with reprogramming, but it has to come from us. And this is where we talk about a new equation of state, market, and society, where the public sphere goes beyond the state. We're not talking about government here. We're talking about the public sphere, something that be belongs to all of us, is collective interest. It's not only a state or a national matter. And of course, we're talking about a new social and intergenerational covenant with specific responsibilities and accountabilities. We're talking about the culture of collective development based on the tolerance of difference and diversity. And of course, we need a long-term vision. We believe that in Latin America, there has been a lot of concentration on the next election instead of the next generation. And we think that there has to be a long-term politics, long-term policies. We believe that innovation is a long-term policy. Education is a long-term policy. Even social inclusion is a long-term policy. And it cannot be done only because next Monday there's going to be an election. It has to be a, a, a long-term policy, a policy of state that has to be channeled through institution. 
Bottom line, we believe growth needs equality, equality needs growth. We need to promote equality by building human skills. We need a larger and a stronger state. This is our message. This is what we are aiming at. This is where ECLAC is. We think that there is light at the end of the tunnel. That light is development. And development is about us. And it has to come bottom up. Deve nobody's going to care about our development except if we do it ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a very full menu of, of, of questions and issues, and uh, it's really quite daunting when you think about the range of the agendas. I couldn't help thinking, though, at the same time that as the issues are, long, are, are substantial and the list is long, there still are many lessons, because if we apply the same frame to thinking about Europe and the United States, we'd have at least an equally long, long list. They're a little different, but I think the, the list is still there. And so the question of, of how do we figure out which are the areas to, um, to prioritize and how we would do that, that's really the, the big challenge. So it's a great honor now to invite uh, uh, Andrea Cornia and, and Martin Sanbu to come to the table to uh, uh, give some, some comments. Um, Dr. Cornia, would you please, you want to start and come over here? And it's great. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ola and um, particularly Professor Cohen for inviting me to comment on this uh, very nice document, Time for Equality, which I would uh, perhaps I suggest a change of title. Could be the social democratization of Latin America, perhaps. <laughs> Now, the reason why I'm so happy to be here is that uh, you know, I have a long-standing interest in the region. I lived in Chile in 1976 under General Pinochet and in ECLAC. And I can say that uh, the region, which I visit quite regularly today, is uh, very different, uh, not only politically, but also economically from what it was then. Second, I have a <clears throat> strong research interest in Latin America. I've recently published some documents. I have one paper in particular which looks at inequality, if you are interested in that. I mean, what happens in inequality during the last 10 years? If you are interested, uh, please tell me. And uh, we are now about to launch a very large research program in WIDA to precisely to try to understand what has happened. And uh, now, a third reason for being particularly interested in what has happened is the relevance of what happened to Latin America perhaps for Europe and United States, United States, but certainly for other developing regions. Now, this morning, a Russian colleague of mine gave me this paper, which ap appeared on, uh, on this PONAS Eurasia Policy Conference, Washington, D.C., October 2010, the Elliott School of International Affairs. And the title of the paper is, Can Brazil Be a Model of Development for Russia? And I think this is uh, interesting to see that uh, uh, there are certainly lessons for development which are uh, emanating from this region. Normally, the gurus of development in these days are China and India. China and India basically have some major limitations. First of all, while growth is progressing faster than in Latin America, inequality has risen, very much so. And in China, which is the guru of uh, development these days, Basically, all the social provision have been dismantled. So you have gone from a situation uh, when, during Chairman Mao, you had a very basic, uh, perhaps very uh, simple uh, access to health and education, but you had it. If you go to China now, and I often go there as well, because my wife is from China, basically people, they tell you, if you are sick, don't go to the doctor. You say, well, where do I go then? To the pharmacist. Because basically, private medicine is basically trying to extract as much as uh, a rent as possible from the patient, like in another country. I wonder which one, I mean, I... <laughs> now, 
the Eastern European countries, I think that, uh, you know, I've written recently a paper comparing the policy experience of Latin America and the Eastern Europe, Eastern European and former, former Soviet Union. And actually what it appears, I mean, this is a region with a great potential. Why? Because the communists, they made a lot of mistakes, but basically sent everybody to school. And then uh, the Soviet Union was the second largest pool of scientists in the world after the US. Now, <clears throat> Of course, there has been a first decade of, if you want to call it, transitional adjustment and so on and so forth. But uh, now, during the last 10 years, they've grown very fast, Qu very fast rising inequality, I mean, despite the fact that there was continuous growth. And then actually, the growth was very similar to the Latin American growth of the 80s, or the 70s and 80s. So then when uh, the crisis hit, I mean, uh, in uh, Latvia, private consumption in three years declined by 40%. So this was a growth finance with the external indebtedness, using hyperliberal policies, uh, using flat tax. So, so altogether, these uh, Latinos tan malos, no? because everybody speaks very, very badly about the Latin American, particularly the Latin American. When I go to Latin America, I keep telling them, you are the, the new Swedes. And they say, no, no, but we are in Latin America. We know how bad we are. You know, it's, it's worse than Italy. You know. <laughs> Now, one could say, but in the recent economic history, we do have an example of uh, which uh, the development pattern which is better than the one which we have today. And this was the growth with equity, or the Asian miracle you know, of the 60s and 70s, when uh, <clears throat> the Japan and then um, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and then uh, Malaysia, and so on and so forth, they grew very fast and with equity. But this was largely in an economy which was non-financialized and uh, semi-open to trade. What Latin America has produced today is what I have defined in the, the research which I've started, open economy redistribution with growth. So the fact that Latin America is able to reduce inequality in, a, in an economy in which trade is totally open <clears throat> and finance, despite what Alicia said, Actually, it is totally open, because the capital controls which have been imposed so far is really a very little thing, you know? So, so there is perhaps a model from which we have to, um, <clears throat> to learn. And the model basically teaches a lesson also on how the region comes out of the current recession, or the, or the recent recession, rather, you know? Now, um, uh, <clears throat> I, on the report itself, now, I think that there is a little bit of a discrepancy between what Alicia, I read all of it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I needed blood transfusions because it's so long. It's a very long, Thin. detailed document, but I read all of it. Because como antiguo, antiguo sepaliño, I had to fight, you know? <laughs> so I, I will make, so Alicia's presentation was a little bit more nuanced, but I will make three types of comments. One is on the analysis. The second one on the crisis, and the third one on the future. Now, you spoke mostly on the future. But uh, my work has been, so far, mainly concentrating on what has happened during the last 20 or 30 years. Now, I have many, many, many points of agreement. Uh, first of all, on the macroeconomic analysis. You know, in the past, I had uh, <clears throat> the pleasure of working with Ricardo French Davis, and I wrote a book which was called Pro-Poor Macroeconomics which basically seems to apply 100% to what is written in this report. So I have no, no reason to disagree almost on anything. Now, there is a very important analysis on the demography, which is uh, seldom uh, considered an irrelevant variable by the economist. There is uh, a very important uh, uh, emphasis on cerrar la breccia between the formal sector and the SMEs. Now, in Italy or in Germany, uh, the SMEs, actually they are, as the report documents quite well, are a major source of creation of wealth. And, uh, and I think that uh, it is important to think that uh, uh, wealth is not achieved only by having huge uh, combinats, big corporations, and so that uh, small can be beautiful if it is properly supported. I am certainly in agreement about the volatility of the capital flows and the regional uh, differences. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I have some perplexity in when I look at the uh, read the analysis of uh, <clears throat> the report. Basically, the report talks about a long period of time between like 98 or 99 until now. 
And then he says, well, things have been changing, and so on and so forth. I see a much clearer fracture, and the fracture is 2002. Now, it's true that uh, taxes, uh, tax GDP ratio started rising before, that the efforts in education started uh, before. But I think that if you do like a Chow test, an econometric test, actually you would see that uh, uh, around, I mean, not necessarily 2002, but around 2000, perhaps in Brazil it's 98, uh, you see that uh, there is one point in which policy shifts. And that is around, uh, in Argentina, it's probably 2003, in Brazil it's probably 1908, so around that. And before then, we had some of these bad policies, which some large institution not far from the city have been promoting, also in Latin America. And, uh, and then there are other policies which uh, have been applied, always gradually, since then. You know. Now, <clears throat> now, this is, I think, is very important. Because if you want to make proposals for the future, then we, we must have a clear understanding of why, the thi why things are getting a little better, or I would say substantially better. No? So, um, <clears throat> so I think that uh, the, the report does not make this uh, distinction, or, or some parts of the report they do, with other parts they don't. It. Now, the second, I would say, probably the main uh, <clears throat> uh, weakness of the report is that the, the report does not discuss the politics of policies. And uh, my observation is that uh, uh, there's sh changes in policies. Now, I, I work for the United Nations, so I know what the United Nations can write. I know that uh, CEPAL, I worked in CEPAL for a little bit, is an intergovernmental institution, so that uh, certain, certain things can be said, other things better say them in private. But the, the bottom line is the, fol is the following, is that all this has happened because the region when I lived in Chile, there was a nice general who was running the country. Now, there has been a gradual return to democracy. The juntas have been sent back to the barracks. There has been a consolidation of democracy. This is, uh, you know, now I'm, at the moment, I mean, I teach in Florence, but this uh, semester, I'm a visiting professor at, uh, at the University of Oxford, at the uh, Nuffield College. Nuffield College is a social sciences college with uh, economists, sociologists, and political scientists. And one of the arguments that uh, is often presented during seminars is that you don't move from dictatorship to, demo to democracy and every everything runs perfectly and so on and so forth. It takes time. And then there are, I mean, normally when you, you analyze the shift from democracy in terms of equality or growth, I don't know, one can say there is at least a time lag of 10, 15, 8, 10, 12 years, something like that. So first is the return to democracy. Uh, second, the consolidation of democracy. Thirdly, the politics of inequality. So I think that you mentioned that. Uh, so inequality has become, again, a major political issue, which, of course, I mean, for people like me, I mean, I've been writing all my life about social justice. And then I think this is, again, a political topic. Before, you know, it was efficiency, Laffer curve, and all these type of things, you know? Now, I think that the election, if you look at the, this consolidation of democracy, has led to the election of left-wing regime. Some a little bit crazy, like uh, Chavez. I mean, I'm not, I'm not in the clock, so you would have a problem in saying that. Others which are quite, quite uh, reasonable, including some of those that in the international press are not uh, very much um, liked, like Mi querida Argentina, not like Argentina. You know, the fact that when uh, Nestor Kirchner died, the stock market surged 20% tells you a lot about what the so-called financial markets. I mean, the financial market should not really, I mean, I mean it was quite disgusting, to my own opinion was, was that, you know. So <clears throat> there, there is, a, so, so there, why, why the left, left of center regimes were elected? Now, there is, in Latin America, there is one thing which is also cited in the report, which is the Latino barometer. There is also one from Africa. And actually, this is a sort of a permanent survey of uh, a large number of people from the region. And actually, you, you could clearly see coming. The people were very, very disappointed with the privatization policies, with the policies of before. So in a sense, uh, there are some nice work done by a colleague of mine at the University of Milan, which uses the Latino barometer to for to predict uh, political change. Now, 
there is another interesting aspect which also was mentioned by, by Alicia. Now, the region, the, the, tomorrow when we go to Pocanto or the day after, I have a one nice chart which basically sh shows a cross. These are the right wing regime and these are the right wing regime. Now, we, in our analysis, we always count only 18 countries. We don't consider the Caribbean country, nor we consider the Guyanas. Uh, and uh, of the islands, we consider only the Dominican Republic. Of the 18 countries, in, uh, just before the, the coup in Honduras, 13 were run by the center left. Two by centrist regime, like uh, Peru, and then two or three by the left, and then, uh, by the right. And then the right actually is basically in power in uh, Mexico and Colombia. No? Now, Colombia, as uh, Alicia showed, is uh, one of the few countries which didn't show any decline in inequality. And Mexico is the only country which has today a tax GDP ratio which is below what it was 20 years ago. So the fiscal covenant that has been mentioned, it didn't come around. Perhaps the result would have been different if the elections had, had been in a different way. Or one can say, perhaps you're wrong. Perhaps it's not the politics or policies which really matter. Perhaps it's Karl Polanyi, you know, the great transformation. And the argument is that um, the, the world is a strange place in which uh, for 20, 30, 40 years there are policies of a certain type, then there is a big swing. And therefore, uh, this is... Um... Now, there is another aspect if in, in the field of politics, and please note, I'm, an, I'm a sort of a, an economist, a poor economist with a modest knowledge about that, is perhaps we are moving towards what we call an accomplished democracy, I mean, at least in part of the region. Uh, in, what happens in Chile? I mean, I, I don't know if in Chile uh, President Piñera will undo completely what has been done by uh, his other people, I mean, his predecessors. I feel that this is not uh, likely, but I may be wrong. Now, if you are in Europe, when, when there, in Sweden there is a center-left or center-right government, there are very, very, very small, very small differences in terms of many of the policies which we see here. In the US, no. In the US, you had uh, enormous changes in tax reforms I mean, with the Reagans. And, I mean, nothing like that happens in Europe. So it may well be that uh, the, 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 there is a change in climate, a Polanyan change in climate, which uh, makes that uh, uh, left-wing countries, left-of-center left regimes, have <coughs> induced changes for themselves and to some extent for the others. But questions uh, Mexico, Colombia. Now, these are the two only large countries which are run by a center right regime. Now, the second point is on the, on the crisis. Well, here I just want to say one thing. Now, the, the crisis has been, is from the chart which has been shown, shown by Alicia. Actually, you, you saw that is a V crisis. When you have a recession, the recession can be a U crisis, so when, when you're at the bottom for quite a while. In this case, they've been at the bottom for months, not years. No? There has been a very fast recovery. And the reason of that, I mean, is that basically the macroeconomic and other policies which had been introduced before, plus the China connection, the re reorientation of trade, um, plus the much faster, much better intervention by the IMF. And so international financing and domestic financing. So the interesting point is that uh, uh, during 2009, uh, inequality in the region has fallen. So it, normally the argument is that when you are in a negative part of the business cycle, you lose employment and so on and so forth. So, so it's normal that, uh, I mean, it's expectable that inequality will rise. Now, we, we looked at the, the last data of Leonardo Gasparini, and actually we see that uh, it has fallen, which is quite remarkable. Now, the third, the third set of comments concern what to do for the future, which has been the main part of your own uh, presentation. My first question is, that which target model? Your, your model basically looks at Western European social democracies. Now, I'm very happy that somebody thinks in this term, because I live in Europe, and in Europe you only think about aerosclerosis, bunga bunga, and then all these type of things. So we are very critical of what <laughs> the, all the problems of the welfare state in Europe and uh, the migration. And so, so we are very appreciative that uh, Los Hermanos de America Latina, Las Hermanas de America Latina, keep thinking that we are representing a model. Of course, we are very proud 
and we, we would never have wanted to exchange our social system with a one of another very attractive country <laughs> who is not far from here, you know. So, <laughs> but there are problems in the, in the social democratic uh, thing. The, the first one, and particularly in reading the report, is that uh, perhaps it might be useful to consider the cost, I mean, not the cost, I mean, the problems of the European welfare state system. And uh, so it, has, it is a major, it is a major result, but it has a large number of problems. Then the question is, it, uh, is it, uh, <clears throat> if you look historically at the development of Europe, can, can one say that Latin America had a similar development? Well, no, because in Latin America you had the bloody latifundia. You know, the Spaniards, they created social institutions which have been highly inequalizing. Now, feudality in Europe through the French Revolution and many other things like that, basically been wiped out. And, and where this type of feudality, feudality has not been uh, uh, resolved, like in parts of Sicily, then you have phenomena like the mafia. You know? So there, there are phenomena, the mafias were the guards of the big landlords, land you know, so originally. Now, so I think that uh, one could say, perhaps there is another sort of comparison that one could do from Latin America. Or perhaps one can say there is an entirely genuine uh, model which does not look only there where there is Western Europe. There, I mean. Now, the second is which type of economic specialization? That is the key issue. Now, here the report seems hesitant. Now, here there is a big dilemma. Nobody has an answer. Now, the region has been uh, part of the recovery of the region has been due to uh, the rise, I mean, the improvement in external condition, including the increase in prices of uh, primary commodities. Now, when I was at university, I read all the Latinos, all, all the colleagues, and then uh, Falletto, Cardoso, Furtado, uh, Prebisch, Singer. So the idea is to say, well, if you depend on commodities, you are going to be, to be on the wrong side of the fence because the, the international terms of trade will deteriorate and so on and so forth. Now, it looks that uh, over the next 20 years, primary commodity price will remain high. So perhaps one could even say, well, why not uh, uh, going full blast towards uh, primary commodities, knowing that this sector has many problems, inequality, low employment, uh, ability, uh, Dutch disease, and so on and so forth. And so we develop policies so as to control all this. You know? um, now, or perhaps we want to use this uh, manna from heaven, and then we have to de develop policies to make sure that in 20 years we are diversified. No? So this is uh, what I would uh, imagine. Uh, now, I think that in the end, in economic history, I don't know of any country which uh, has uh, developed without going through some process of uh, industrialization and, mo and modern services. There was at some point a debate on leapfrogging in India. So the India jumps from agriculture to inter internet services. But actually, it's not true, because India is also developing its uh, modern sector, modern manufacturing sector, like pharmaceuticals, for instance, uh, and uh, automotive, and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> now, if one wants to diversify, there are some two or three problems which uh, have been duly mentioned by Dr. Bassina. Well, number one, low savings rate. Now, the reliance on foreign savings basically displaces domestic savings. This is, this is what I teach my students. So, so if you have a 20% savings ratio and then you bring in 10 points, actually, you're not going to have 20 plus 10 equal 30, but this 20 will become 15. So it will go perhaps up to 25 or perhaps less. So there is a, dis a clear displacement effect via a variety of economic mechanisms. Now, that is uh, the low savings is uh, fairly closely connected to the openness of the capital account, not to the, tr of the current account. Now, and that leads to, uh, is anti-industrial. Even uh, the guru Brazil, basically, uh, my friend from Brazil, they keep telling me that uh, is deindustrializing. I'm almost done. So, <clears throat> so the, I think that the, the issue of uh, who finances, who is, where, from where will capital come to finance modernization is as to be, and I wouldn't be particularly, I, I don't know of anyone who has been saved by somebody else. You know, some, you have to pay for your own industrialization. Now, then the question is, it, which policies? And I think that uh, on, on our policies, we are basically very much into agreement. Uh, and then, since we are a little bit pressed for time, I would uh, conclude uh, 
mentioning something what I call missing policies. Now, the missing policies uh, is the following. Uh, Latin America has redistributed one asset, which is knowledge through education. I mean, a lot still to remains to be done. But, uh, uh, I mean, I think it is quite uh, an important achievement. And in all the calculation we do in our econometric exercise, it appears that the major, the variable which explains the most the decline of inequality are not the transfers, but basically the reduction of inequality in the distribution of human capital among the workers, you know? So after many, many years of education. Then. Now, there is another asset which has not been redistributed, another two assets. One is financial resources, so access to credit markets, that is not that. And then, most glaring of all is land. Now, Latin America has an, an incomplete land reform agenda. Now, it's true that the, the Latin America is becoming more and more urban, but in economics, there are very close relations between low wages in the urban sector and low wages in agriculture. So perhaps uh, in uh, time for equality, you may consider also this dimension of uh, inequality. I very much read, liked reading the report. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think you raised many very important questions and which we'll have time to, uh, to discuss in the ensuing days. And now, uh, Martin Sandu, Sanbu uh, from the Financial Times. Oh, why don't I just sit here? Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, Michael Cohen asked me to talk about the lessons Europe could draw from Latin America, and I think vice versa. Uh, but he also asked me to talk for 10, 15 minutes, and I think I can only do full justice to one of those two things. Um, so I'm going to stick to the short time and just scratch the surface of, of two themes that I think come up in this report among a lot of themes. Is this working? Um, uh, and hopefully we can, we can talk about them in, in the Q&A. So the two themes I would like to just share some thoughts on are, are the macroeconomics of the crisis uh, and inequality. And you might think that the first is a European topic and the second is a Latin American topic. I think they are a bit more related than that, but uh, you might see why it, why it looks like that at first sight, because Latin America didn't have a financial crisis. I don't want to minimize the impact of the crisis on Latin America, but that was all through trade. That was all because of the collapse in world trade. There was not a financial crisis in the way that the US and uh, Europe experienced. Uh, and why was that? Uh, well, it was because in this case, the rich countries inflicted on themselves uh, the kind of crisis that they've inflicted on developing countries for the last three decades or so. Um, and so Latin America has had the uh, sort of dubious benefit of learning from its mistakes. Uh, they obviously had a big financial crisis in 1982, the tequila crisis to a lesser degree, and, and a wave of uh, sovereign defaults or sovereign debt crisis, we should say, not all defaults, uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, and as a result, policies were changed. So, I mean, one thing that happened in the 80s was that the banking systems were, were so broken that when they were fixed, they were kept, um, you know, uh, on a leash, as it were. So they stayed fairly simple and fairly boring and fairly robust, unlike the American and uh, North American and uh, European banking systems, which were allowed to do all sorts of funny, funky things. Um, the Latin American banking systems did not. Uh, and of course, the sovereign debt crisis experience uh, was part of what led to very strong discipline uh, in fiscal affairs. Now, if Europe, and, and I'm thinking in particular about the European, the West European periphery, Southern Europe, if you like, um, if they had heeded the lessons that Latin America learned, I, I think things would have looked very different in Europe over the past year. Now, some of the policies that Latin American countries implemented uh, would be impossible within Europe. Capital controls, of course, are illegal within the European Union. Uh, you can't really do much about your nominal exchange rate when you're in a, a unified currency. You can do something about your real exchange rate, but it's very, very, very hard. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the fiscal rules, of course, could have been followed, but in practice they weren't, despite the... Uh, um, inaptly named uh, Growth and Stability Pact. And so uh, what you saw 
in the, uh, in the European Union over the past 10 years were these huge uh, international, but within, within Euro area and within the European Union capital flows that the Latin American experience would have taught you are dangerous. So huge inflows in the periphery in boom times that then suddenly stopped in the crisis. Now, that in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I mean, that there's, a, there's a tendency to say that imbalances or asymmetries are, are intrinsically bad. I don't think they are. I think it's perfectly normal for fast-growing countries, especially poor fast-growing countries, to be borrowing internationally. That's what they should be doing. And rich, slow-growing countries should be lending. Uh, the challenge, of course, is uh, to make sure that those, that borrowing is channeled into investments that actually help growth. And this is what failed to happen in Greece, where the current account deficit was matched by um, a fiscal deficit. So basically, the borrowing went to uh, public consumption. Um, in Spain, things were quite different because the, uh, the fiscal policy was impeccable. It, you know, it was one of the best performers in the European Union. So even if you had drawn the lessons on fiscal probity from Latin America, that wouldn't have helped. The problem in Spain was a huge private sector deficit. Uh, but as we know, after a financial crisis, private problems become public problems. Uh, but what happened was that huge flows within Europe from the north to Spain were invested in houses that now nobody wants. Um, the problem aren't the flows themselves, the problem is what they're used for. And, and here, I think it's very clear that governments have a very important role to play. And at this point, I think, there's a lesson Latin America can draw from Europe as well. Uh, because with the very quick rebound we're seeing in Latin America at the moment, you do find these enormous inflows into, uh, into Latin America, like with other emerging countries. You know, I was saying uh, Latin America hadn't had a financial crisis. I think uh, you know, if there's anyone now who can get credit, it's an emerging country government. Um, so you, f you find rising current account deficits in some countries or in the big structural natural resource exporters. You still have surpluses, but they're smaller than they, than they could have been. So you have these inflows, and I think where the lesson can be turned back is for Latin American countries to see what happens if those inflows, which aren't in themselves bad, they're the right economic flow, if they're not put into the correct investments. Now, there's an obvious role for the state there. I don't think it's... Uh, the conclusion is you need a larger state. I think you need a, a stronger state, perhaps, or a smarter state. But you need state policies to make sure that investments flow uh, to the users that will actually produce growth. Um, flows like that often go into non-tradables, which obviously can't be exported to pay for the debt. So it's crucial that there are, they are non-tradables that promote uh, exporting sectors. Uh, let me say a few words about uh, inequality. Uh, because the crisis and inequality are actually much more related than it might seem at first thought. Uh, I commend to your reflection uh, the latest book by Raghu Rajan uh, that's called Fault Lines. And it also just got the uh, Financial Times Prize for Best Business Book of the Year. So that's a self-promotion. Um, the um, I mean, We're not selling it. But I'm sure you can order it from the FT website. So... Uh, Rajan's very provocative argument is that the crisis or the policies that led to the crisis were at least in part caused by inequality in the US uh, because the sort of liquidity flood uh, that happened was a palliative. It sort of hid the problems of stagnating wages in the bottom half of the income distribution. Uh, now you, you can argue with that, but it's, it's a very, very thought-provoking argument, I think, that inequality is in fact a possible cause of instability. Now, the other way, of course, is also true. Instability is bad for inequality. Uh, Andres Velasco, the, the former Chilean uh, finance minister, used to say that, um, still says, I'm sure, orthodox, uh, orthodox macroeconomic policies, fiscal prudence and so on, are very progressive policies because it's the poor that get hurt by, get hurt by runaway inflation and by busts and boom cycles. Uh, I think that's quite true, and I think you see that to some extent in Europe now, both in the remedies for the crisis, the very lax monetary policies help all of those who are already creditworthy because they can borrow at low rates, that means the people who are rich, uh, but of course it doesn't help those who can't get access to credit. Um, and you also see 
the effect of the fiscal consolidation programs that are happening at the moment. Um, this depends a bit on the country, I think. If you're Greece, there's so much slack in the system, so many people are not paying their taxes, that fiscal consolidation can, in fact, be progressive if it means that you start making people who have a lot pay the taxes they owe. In a country like Britain, where we've just seen the new government's comprehensive spending review, it's inevitable, no matter what the government tries to say, that, that fiscal consolidation will be regressive. Uh, there's really very little way around that because uh, in the crisis, because of the unsustainable policies of the previous government, you had the state share of the economy grow from the high 30s in the, as a percentage of GDP to about 48%, close to half. Uh, and that's neither efficient nor are people willing to bear that in the, uh, in the long run. So you will need a consolidation there. Um, just one final thought on, on the role of the state. I mean, I sense that ECLAC is quite enamored with, with uh, the Scandinavian sort of welfare state. Now, I'm from Norway, uh, and I think the, the most extraordinary thing about Norway, one of the most egalitarian countries in the world, isn't the, redistrib the redistributive tax system. Because like all rich welfare states, most of the redistribution in Norway happens within the middle class. It's usually what happens with developed welfare states. What's extraordinary in Norway is that the pre-tax income distribution is so tight. Before any redistributive mechanisms or fiscal redistributive mechanisms, you have a very egalitarian uh, income distribution. And one, one theory about why that happened is that you had national wage bargaining that compressed the wage structure, that forced companies to substitute away from low skills and into capital, which in turn increased the productivity of all workers, and you got a virtuous sort of egalitarian cycle that way. But note the difference between saying that you need to redistribute incomes from pre-tax to post-tax in equ uh, equality uh, to saying that the state ha has a role in aiming for a tighter pre-tax distribution, which might not lead you to conclude in favor of a big state, but a very active state, but not necessarily one that holds a big part of the national economy. Uh, and I think on this, actually, Latin America, to conclude, has maybe shown some of the most inventive kind of policies. Just, just two examples, the, the conditional cash transfers that you see, well, all over the region now, but they started with uh, Progresa in Mexico and Bolsa Familia in Brazil. These are very cheap interventions that do a lot of good both in terms of raising productivity uh, levels, labor participation, and so on, but obviously just income also. Uh, and then something like the Chilean uh, policy for school vouchers, if you want to call them that, subsidies that follow the student to private schools or public schools as they might choose. Uh, again, policies that haven't been tried in Europe, but there might be much more inventive ways of dealing with inequality than what many European countries uh, have done. So, just to finish, it seems to me that both regions can learn a lot from each other's mistakes so long as they don't imitate them. Great. Thank you, Martin. Those are great, great comments. And I think, I think the, uh, there's, there's the story of how, uh, how the quality of the report elicits good comments. It's always a statement also about the report. So I, I think that's, that's, that's really good. Um, we have a few minutes um, for, for some questions for the floor. Um, I don't know if there are anybody has any particularly burning comment. Yes? And why don't you identify yourself and really try to keep it uh, short, please. just elected our new president in Brazil today, a woman, by the way. And I would like to know, in your opinion, what would be her main challenge in what regards to, to reduce inequality in the country? Thank you. Maybe we'll collect a few questions and then give her an answer. Any other questions from anybody? No? OK, yeah? It's very clear, and then the first uh, manifest that is very clear now with Alicia that uh, the CLAC has uh, firmly reassumed their uh, traditions, their roots in the development of Latin America. Of course, this is a long term process, but with Alicia, this is very, very clear. It is, uh, uh, Alicia's red book is plenty of, of, uh, of uh, provocation for, for, for theoretical. Uh, 
problem. And uh, I think uh, and at least two of the main uh, issues that requires a lot of work are related to the, the, the taxation system and the reconstruction of a sovereign system of credit. I don't know if you can uh, you can elaborate a little bit more about uh, what are the prospects in uh, in black clouds. Okay. Yes, one more. I'm Karen Williams. Um, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, my question is, um, if if social inclusion is such an important thing in order to stimulate equality, what policies are in place throughout the region to include? Uh, people of color, especially, you know, Afro descendants. There are apparently 90 million Afro descendants throughout the region, and what policies are in place in specific countries? Thanks. Okay. Tom? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other question. In the original glory days in Ecuador, there were planning ministries all throughout the region, and it's systematically It's no longer taught or studied or theorized about. And it strikes me that this is a huge gap. And that is the first time. Second of all, maybe this is coincidental, but arguably a period where you see this interesting <coughs> reduction in inequality is also the period where, again, arguably the United States is paying least attention to Latin America. <coughs> Comment on that. Or if you're not, that's fine. <laughs> Thank Maybe you. Some of the other members. <laughs> Okay, one more final comment. Uh, yes, um, uh, the point was raised that the IMF is, um, is interested now in capital controls. I wonder if you could comment on um, the reaction of institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank on other issues that you've raised, such as industrial policy, labor, labor flexibilization. Are they moving on side on those kinds of issues? Great, thank you. Well, I guess we've got another couple of hours for the question, but maybe you could just handle them brief briefly and, and then we can call it a night, so please. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. The first thing I want to say is I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I will be, but okay. not yet. Secondly, I would say that in Brazil, we are following very closely Brazil, and we can say that, I, I mean, there are a lot of challenges ahead of, of, of Dilma Rousseff. By the way, we are very happy that she won with such a difference, and almost 12, 12 points of difference. Um, we believe that, of course, fiscal structure is gonna be one of them. I mean, Brazil has a, a tax burden that is a good tax burden, let's say, but the structure is the one that probably will have to be reviewed. Of course, here is Osvaldo Kasev, who is more an expert on that area, my director of, the, of economic development, but that's one of the challenges she will face. The other one, I think, is territorial convergence. There's no question that Brazil has still inequalities regarding the, uh, the different territories that they will have to bring in. Uh, and, and of course, I think that uh, the, the question is, I think Dilma really won for another reason, and that's the good part, that is continuity. I think that Brazil has been very successful in their, in their equality policies. I would say that not only uh, Bolsa Familia, but there are many other things that have been done. Territorios da Ciudadanía is another very interesting program that has been uh, done in Brazil. And uh, I think there is there is something there. But of course, there are other challenges that maybe my colleagues, especially on the macro side, I think there are some challenges there. And of course, the exchange rate is a challenge for the whole of Latin America. The appreciation of the currencies is something that it's conspiring, as you very well said against the industrial policies. I mean, it's, it's the instrument they are using as an industrial policy instrument, but it's a disincentive rather than incentive. So I guess that those are the questions. And the, of course, the coordination between the central bank and the finance minister will be something to look at. And, and the other thing that I think Dilma Rousseff will have to look very carefully is environmental sustainability. I think that Marina da Silva made a point, I mean, whether uh, 20 points of support in Brazil is a lot, and that means that people are interested in, in environmental sustainability, and, and that's something that she might have to look at. Pedro, I think that um, 
Indeed, we are um, looking at the taxation system very carefully in terms of, uh, as I said before, not only the, um, the, the income that has to be brought in by a, a higher tax burden in some countries like Mexico, which is doing very badly on that front, but also on the structure of the taxation systems. We believe that we have to look into those very carefully to look at uh, direct taxes and indirect taxes. And of course, we believe that country by country, and of course in, in ECLAC we're, we're working on a country-based uh, analysis, comparative analysis to look at the taxation system. In the systems of credit, I think that the problem is that the financial systems are, you said that, right, are not very well developed in Latin America. I mean, there are some countries that have financial systems that are developed. And on top of that, there is no systems that are looking closely to the banking sector for, for the poor, frankly speaking, and how the access and the systems of credit can be developed for, especially for small and, and medium-sized companies. And there is where Mario, I think you're working on that, I hope. <laughs> no, I, I know you are, of course, and we are trying very hard to, to do something there in the system of credit, but it's not easy. It's not easy because it's, it's, uh, we're starting from, a, from an experience that is not very good, that the financial system is, is in a, bit, a very big crisis altogether. Afro-descendants and indigenous peoples is something that we are worried about, but I have to admit that ECLAC has done very little on that, and we have to look closely to that. And that is, especially we have been working now more through the women's and the gender strategy, and by the way, we're very happy that Michelle Bachelet is here in New York, and, and I think she's, she's working very closely on these two topics, Afro-descendants and indigenous peoples. In ECLA, we are, we are going to go into this issue more and more because we have been asked by our member states to look into this, and, and that's good news for us, but we haven't done a lot, and we should. Of course, Martin Oppenheim is, is the director of social development in ECLAC, and by the way, he was also the coordinator the, of this report, so I want to acknowledge his presence here. In terms of the planning ministries, I think that we need to, um, in ECLAC, we have a body that is called ILPES, which brings together all the planning ministries. And of course, as you said, a lot of them have disappeared, but they are coming back. I mean, the good news is that a lot of countries are rethinking their planning. Uh, I don't know if ministries are, as such, but they are coming back to planning as a powerful tool for development. Many of them are working on long-term strategies. For example, El Salvador, Guatemala, Costa Rica, in Central America, they're asking us to help them in thinking their future. Argentina, we're working with a lot of countries now on how to bring back planning. I mean, as, as a very important, let's say, uh, sector or activity that has to be uh, has to be done by the state and the IMF. Um, mm. Oh, okay. I mean, in, in terms of the capital uh, control, we we have been converging on the ideas. I think in in uh, flexi labor flexibility, not that much. I think they recognize what you said. Uh, the IMF, in a recent paper they did with ILO with the International Label Organization, they recognized that inequality was very much at the origins of the financial crisis. So that's a little step forward in the sense that they start to recognize that labor plays a very important role in labor, labor markets, and income plays a very important role. But, and, and I think that the IMF, by the way, they are trying to do a serious exercise that I don't want to, I mean, I want to recognize. I think IMF is, is creating some windows and facilities for, for emerging countries, basically, unfortunately. The, the poorest countries still have to go for the standby <laughs> traditional agreements. But I think that with Strauss-Kahn there, I, there is an opportunity, and Oliver Blanchard, I have to say, those two, are, um, Oliver Blanchard in particular, they're trying to think things in a different way. I think that's something that uh, gives some hope. So um, I would say that by the time being, but I would like to tell you all that tomorrow, this is a teamwork. Uh, this was done by this group of people that are sitting here and the 700 people that work at ECLAC under the coordination of Martin and myself and, and a lot of uh, the directors that are here really did a l very good job. And tomorrow in Pocantico, I think we're going to have a chance to go topic by topic and, and 
maybe answer in a more better way your questions. Thank you very much, Alicia. I think uh, it's been a very full um, afternoon. I think the many questions have been have been raised. I'd like to to thank some of the people involved with uh, organizing this meeting. Uh, Cecilia Golombek, who unfortunately was called off to Buenos Aires, uh, Christina Gomez, Tanushre Dutta Isaacman, Alejandro Otero, and Mary Robbins have all been very helpful in, in organizing this. It's part of the, the OLA team. And um, I'd like to, to thank everybody for participating. Uh, some of us are going to, as, as was suggested, we're going to continue this conversation in the next couple of days. And then later um, in, in the next couple of weeks, we will report back to the university community about some of the conclusions for this. We'll also be uh, putting out a, uh, a publication on some of these conclusions uh, fitting into this, the OLA series. And so I'd just like to thank you all for your support and interest. But mostly I'd like to thank the ECLAC team and, and uh, Alicia for, uh, for a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.